a little over a week ago, I, I had a good conversation with one of our high school students. And uh, this conversation got me thinking about uh, this idea of, of, of confidence. Uh, not he spoke to me in confidence, and I'm going to break that by telling you what he said, but confidence in terms of how do you get that affirmation? How do you get that assurance, that hope? How do you have that confidence that your decision is right or wrong? How do you have confidence to proceed forward? How do you have confidence in small decisions, big decisions? How do you have confidence in the overall trajectory of your life that you're going the right way? And I want to share this conversation or a part of it with you because it got me thinking about where do I find my own confidence? Uh, given that it was a conversation between the two of us, I, I did go and ask for his permission to share this part of the conversation. But as we were talking, he told me about his hopes and his dreams for the future. He was confident, he was certain as a high schooler of where he wanted to go for university. He said, I already know that I want to go to Texas A&M. Without a doubt, I'm going to Texas A&M. Right? And so I said, okay, hey, that sounds good. As somebody else that was there in the conversation interjected and asked, well, hey, have you considered Bible school and then maybe in the future seminary? You know, at Bible school, you can study God's word. You can study about God. At the same time, you can work towards a degree in the liberal arts and sciences. And the high schooler says this, okay, I'll go to Bible college and then I'll go to seminary if, and I quote, lightning strike, boom, voice from heaven, God says Bible college. And I said, fine, fair enough. And so I asked him, you are certain you are to go to A&M? He says, correct. And so I asked him, why are you so confident? Did you get lightning strike, boom, voice from heaven, God saying a and M? Is that why you're so confident? And he said, no. Is lightning strike, boom, voice from God looking for confidence? Or is it a stall tactic that we oftentimes use? I thought about the decisions that I make in my life and the confidence and the lack of confidence that I have. If you were to ask me, should Nellie and I, my wife, go on vacation to Hong Kong? I can tell you absolutely, without a doubt, yes, we should go on vacation to Hong Kong. Nellie, her parents are in Hong Kong. Nellie's grandmother's in Hong Kong. She has aunts and uncles and cousins that I've never met that are in Hong Kong. It would be great to visit and to see where my wife grew up. Without a doubt, let's go on vacation to Hong Kong. No question about it. Should Nellie and I go to Hong Kong as missionaries? Okay. Well, give us time. We need to pray about this one, okay? We need to make sure it's the right thing to do. I need that lightning strike, boom, voice from heaven. I was at the mall, and I saw this guy with a Florida Gator hat. And you don't see that too much here in Texas. And so I got really excited. I walked right up to him and said, hey, go Gators, right? My name's Brian. I'm class of 06. He said, yeah, hey, I'm class of 03. As we're talking about the University of Florida and campus life and Florida and all these things, this internal conflict arose and started saying, God, should I talk to him about Christ? Now, God, you know, maybe if there's, there's a flash of lightning, boom, a voice from heaven, talk to him about Christ, then I would be confident. Why is it that I did not need lightning strike, boom, voice from heaven to be certain to go to vacation to Hong Kong? Why is it that I did not need lightning strike, boom, from heaven to say go Gators? But I have all this doubt, I have all this resistance, I need to buy time 
by looking for lightning strikes, boom, voice from heaven when it comes to obeying God and his word. Now, don't get me wrong. It is important to pray. It is important to take time to seek after God's will and to seek after his direction. But the thing I want us to consider this morning is where do you find your confidence? And when we say, let's take time to pray about it, let's truly take time to pray about it and not just use that as a stall tactic. But where do you find the confidence in the decisions that you make in your life? Decisions small or big? Decisions for the overall trajectory of your life? How are you confident or are you confident at all of whether or not you're going the right direction. This morning we're going to see two what's, two whys, and two hows. Two what's. What is to give us as followers of Jesus Christ great confidence that we're heading in the right direction. Two whys. Why are these two what's what they are? Followed by two hows. In light of the what, why, application. How do we live that out in our lives? This morning, if you would, please turn with me in your Bibles to Philippians chapter 1. And this morning, we're going to be looking at verses 18 through 26. Philippians chapter 1, 18 through 26. You can find Philippians towards the right-hand side of your Bibles. It's in the New Testament. The New Testament begins with Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, keep going. Acts, Romans, keep going. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians. We'll be in chapter 1, beginning with verse 18, going through 26 this morning. Philippians is written by the Apostle Paul. He planted the church back in around 48 to 51 AD. And it's over 10 years later, sometime around 61 and 62 AD, that he writes this letter to the church at Philippi. At this time, Paul is imprisoned under house arrest in Rome. And he writes this letter to the church at Philippi to thank the believers there, to thank them for their encouragement, for their support, and to also encourage them to live the Christian life. Throughout the month of August, we've been going through Philippians, and we've been going through this series looking at the measure of success. How do we as followers of Jesus Christ measure our success and know if we are successful in following Jesus? We saw three weeks ago, verses 1 through 11, that the measure of success is found in how we partner with one another in the gospel and how we mature daily in the Lord. Two weeks ago, we looked at verses 12 through 14, that the measure of success is found in the advancement of the gospel in our lives. And the last week, we looked at verses 15 through 18, that the measure of success is found in the ways that we value the gospel as more important, prioritize it above our own lives and our own well-being. This morning, we're going to look at verses 18 through 26, seeing how the measure of success is dependent upon where we find our confidence in the decisions that we make. Follow along with me as we look at verse 18 and 19. 18, what then, only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. Picking up from where we were last week, Paul is speaking about being in prison in Rome and how there are those who are attacking him. Those who are preaching in Christ and doing so in a loving way, supporting Paul. But there's also those who are speaking in pretense, passing off lies as if they were true. They're attacking Paul, but while they're preaching the gospel. And so Paul values the gospel more than his own reputation. And he rejoices because whether in pretense or in truth, the gospel is being proclaimed. Moving on. 
Yes, and I will rejoice. Why? Verse 19. For I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. What is Paul expressing here in verse 19? Paul is expressing great confidence. He says, for I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit, the support of the body of believers, and by the help of the Holy Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. Paul is confident. He is sure of his deliverance. Deliverance from what? As Paul is writing this letter, he is in prison in Rome. He is under 24-7 house arrest, chained to a guard. Why does he have so much confidence of his deliverance, of his salvation? Based on the following verses here, Paul is not speaking of his physical deliverance out of imprisonment, but he is assured of a far greater deliverance than that. He is sure of his ultimate deliverance, his salvation in Jesus Christ, that no matter what happens to him, he knows he is on the right path And he has the confidence that he will be delivered not only physically, emotionally, but spiritually as well. Where does this great confidence of Paul's come from? What does Paul place his confidence in? By all accounts, All the decisions that he's made up until this point from a worldly standard is we might say, man, Paul, you done messed up. You got on a ship and it was a shipwreck. You done messed up. You built a fire and a snake bit you. You done messed up. You went to Rome and you shared your testimony and they imprisoned you. Why do you have so much confidence? Everything seems to be going wrong in your life. Why are you so confident you're going on the right path? Verse 20. As it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. Paul is so confident because his confidence is not based upon his life or his death. His confidence is not based on something that changes from day to day. His confidence is not based on something that can be so easily taken away from him. Paul is confident he is heading in the right direction. Why? Where does he place his confidence? What is his confidence in? Look at 20 again. But that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body. Paul's confidence does not reside in how he is doing day to day. Paul's confidence is not based upon suffering or comfort in his mortal body. But Paul is confident he's going the right direction because he's placed his confidence in Jesus Christ. He is confident that no matter what happens to him, he's made the right decisions in his life So that whether he dies or lives, Christ may be exalted and Christ may be praised. As followers of Jesus Christ, what should give you full confidence in the decisions that you make? You should receive full confidence not based upon will this decision make me comfortable or uncomfortable. You should receive full confidence not based on a decision Will it make the most financial returns or will it take a loss? It shouldn't be based upon is this the right school or the wrong school, the right job or the wrong job. But will this decision glorify and praise Jesus Christ? Will this decision that I'm making not leave me ashamed but that with full courage now always Christ will be honored in my body. Place 
your confidence in Christ by asking yourself this. Will this decision honor Christ? Is this decision going to obey Christ and will proclaim Christ and will it honor him or will I be found ashamed? If we stand before the judge, would you be ashamed that you made all these decisions to delay following Jesus Christ? When you stand before the judge, will you be found ashamed, lacking confidence that you chased after the world, you chased after comfort instead of surrendering all to follow him? And why is this so important? Why is it so important that we place our confidence in the right place? It is so important that we place our confidence in Christ in the right place. Because many of us can run the race with a false confidence. Many of us can place our confidence in the wrong place and run the race with full confidence. But there's a great danger there. Growing up, I loved watching American Gladiators, right? So it ran through the 90s. They tried to reboot it, but it failed. And so American Gladiators, the whole premise is this. It pitted average Joes and Janes, these average people. This guy has a nine-to-five job. Uh, he's got children. He's married. Uh, this is a housewife. And they suit them up in pads and helmet. And they have to battle against these gladiators, these athletes, these muscle-bound men and women. A lot of these people, they put up the stats. Okay, in this corner, we have Brian from Plano. Uh, he's, you know, 5'8", 160 pounds. And then in this corner, we've got Laser, right? 6'6", six six, 250 pounds, ex-NFL player, all right? And they'll joust, they'll battle, they'll wrestle, they'll do all these things to run this race. My favorite was the final obstacle course. Towards the end of this obstacle course, there were four lanes. And as these people ran through this obstacle course, they came up to this particular obstacle, and they had to choose between four different lanes. Each lane was clear. Each lane they could pick from, and at the end of each lane was a doorway. And the doorway was covered with a thick piece of paper, and it was covered so that you could not see what was behind the door. Behind one of the four doors, there was no one there. It was clear. Behind three of the four doors was a gladiator. Laser, Turbo, and his buddy. All six foot six, 250 pounds of them waiting behind for the contestant to come in. Right? While the contestants could not see who was behind each door, it was great for the viewer at home because the viewer at home could see what the people were running into. Right? And so being the good boy that I am, I would hope that they would be running into the gladiator. Right? And so contestant one by one, they would come up to each lane. They have a choice to make. And with great confidence, they would choose a certain lane. They would run full steam ahead, jump through the piece of paper, and hope for the best. It's so important, it's so critical that we place our confidence in Jesus Christ Because it's so easy for us to be fooled. It's so easy for us to run each and every day with a false confidence. And the trouble with the false confidence is that there's a great and false consequence. In this life, there are many paths you can take. You can choose lane one, lane two, lane three, lane four. The world says there are many paths to salvation. There are many paths to eternal life. Pick one. But based on God's word, from the perspective of the scriptures, we get a bird's eye view of the whole picture. There are many running the race, not knowing what lies on the other end of death. 
But based on God's word, we can see very full well which lane our friends are running in. We can see very full well, even for ourselves, which lane are we running in and what awaits us on the other side. While there are many lanes that we can choose from, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Jesus is the one and only way, and he is the only path to eternal life, to full and restored relationship with God. Every other lane that this world provides. There's this lane called education. There's this lane called financial stability. There's this lane called status. And all of those lanes promise a false confidence. Take this lane and you can save yourself. Put in hard work, good works, and you can save yourself. But based on the perspective of Scripture, we can see full well where they're going. That those choose a path other than through Jesus Christ, they're going to go crashing, not through the door, but they'll be crashing through death and awaits them on the other side is not a gladiator, but something far, far worse. It is conscious and eternal torment to pay the wages of sin, to suffer for all eternity the wrath of God. As followers of Jesus Christ, the problem that we oftentimes face is not that we lack confidence. All of us here this morning are one way or another confidently choosing one path to live. You're confidently going to work. You're confidently going to school. You're confidently being a parent, whether doing a good job or not, but you're confidently doing it, right? The problem is not that we lack confidence. The problem is that Oftentimes, we have a false confidence, and our confidence is in the wrong place. What gives us confidence as followers of Jesus Christ? Our confidence comes from placing it in Him. Application point. To find confidence in the decisions that you're making big or small, the entire trajectory of your life, ask yourself this. Will Christ be honored in this decision that I make? Your confidence isn't going to come from which school you pick to go to, but your confidence is going to come from whether or not you honor Christ during your time at whatever school you pick. Your confidence is not going to come from which boy or girl you choose to date or marry, but your confidence is going to come with whether or not you honor Christ in your relationship and marriage. Your confidence is not going to come from which job you decide to take or not take, but your confidence is going to come from whether or not you honor God through your work, whatever you choose to do. The second why, what and why is important. Where else does our confidence come from? What will help steer the directions that we make? Let's look at the second perspective we are to take. Verses 21 through 26. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Uh, the following verses, Paul puts to words, this internal struggle that he has. There's this great tension in his life. He says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me, yet which shall I choose I cannot tell. I'm hard pressed between the two, life or death. My desire is to depart and to be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is far more necessary on your account. 
convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. Paul is caught between the life here and now and the life he has after death, which he cannot choose. To remain is good because he can continue to proclaim Christ and to walk with fellow believers. But he says to die is far better because that means he gets to be with Jesus. To live is great. He gets to tell others about Christ. But think about it. To die is far better because then he gets to be with Christ. What gives Paul confidence, whether he lives or dies, whether he stays in imprisonment or he's in freed, what gives Paul full confidence is first and foremost, he places his confidence in Christ. He knows that the decisions that he's made will glorify God. Secondly, Paul has confidence because he has confidence in comfort because he considers both his life here and now and the one after death. Why is this important? Because all too often, when we only think about confidence and comfort on this side of death, that builds up a false confidence and false comfort. When we only consider confidence and comfort for this side of death, we then have a false and incomplete confidence and incomplete comfort. We're missing so much more. When someone passes, the way those who are living and remain talk about the passing of a loved one reveals a lot about how our culture, how our society, how our families, how we even individually view life and death. And it also shows where we place our confidence. But I think it's safe to say also that it also shows that our confidence is a little short. When my grandfather passed away about five years ago, our family was very comforted knowing that Hopefully he was comforted that he was surrounded by family. We hear that oftentimes. When someone passes, we comfort one another by the passing of loved one by saying they were surrounded by loved ones. But how is this perspective still short-lived? Because at the end of the day, my grandfather still died and he couldn't take that confidence with him. At the end of the day, for those who are living, though we were around him while he died, he still died and he's no more. If our confidence is only up until the point of someone's death, then that leaves us with great fear of what happens thereafter. Another phrase that's oftentimes heard when someone passes, is they died doing what they loved. They died doing what they loved. Recently, a stunt woman died doing a stunt for a movie that's coming out. And as I was reading this story, friends and family said, well, they died doing what they loved. They died doing a stunt, right? On the deadliest catch, when one of the fishermen died out at sea, friends and family said, well, at least he died doing what he loved. I want to be sensitive to those who have passed and those who find comfort in those words, right? Not to take anything away from that. So I'll speak of myself personally of what I feel of these words. When I die, I hope that those around me that the greatest comfort that they would receive is not that I died with friends and family around me. 
I hope that the greatest comfort that those around me can have is not that I died doing what I love. In fact, if I end up dying while doing what I loved, I hope that will leave you even more sad and tormented. Right? Because that's not the way I want to go, okay? But you think about it. If I die doing what I love, all right, I love playing basketball, all right? So this afternoon, we play basketball here 2 to 4.30 p.m. Anyone who wants to come out? And so let's say it's 2 to 4.30, and let's say I got a good sweat going. It's 3 o'clock. We just ran a full court game. My heart's pounding, beating out my chest because I don't exercise throughout the week. And we still have an hour and a half of basketball left. And I step on the court, and there and there, I drop dead. And people are going to say, well, at least he died doing what he loved. But I would say, I think it's worse to die doing what you love. Because you know what? If I die doing what I love, that means I didn't get to play basketball, right? I missed out on an hour and a half of basketball. That's not good. That's sad. I think there's a lot more comfort if you can say, Brian died doing what he didn't like doing, all right? If I go home this afternoon, I take the garbage out of the trash can, and as I heave it into the dumpster, let's say the bottom breaks out, all right? And all the moldy, slimy, gooey trash just spills on the floor. That drink I didn't finish earlier in the week is now on the ground. That sandwich that I half ate is just covered in mold, and now I have to pick it up. I really don't want to do this. And as I go down to pick it up, oh, I fall over and die. Yes! <laughs> I died doing what I didn't like, therefore I didn't have to do it. There's little assurance up until the point of death of being surrounded by loved ones. There's little confidence up until the point of death doing what you love. Because at the point of death, you still die. Because at the point of death, you go on to meet your creator and to stand before the judge and to give an account of the life that you live. There's no confidence for those who are followers of Jesus Christ merely of who they die around or what they did when they died. But the confidence comes from having a full perspective of life here now and after. You can have confidence or lack confidence based on this assurance. That the life you live now will greatly mirror your life after death. While we have a shadow, a foretaste of the things to come, the life that you live now is a good indicator of the life you may or may not have after death. For those who spend this life following Jesus Christ, proclaiming Jesus Christ, you can be full confident that after death, you'll be with Jesus Christ. For those who spend their life putting off Jesus Christ, delaying following Jesus Christ, for those who spend their lives pursuing after the world, you can have full assurance and confidence that after death, what awaits is the same that awaits the rest of this world. Not to be in eternity with God, but to spend eternity suffering God's wrath. Where do you find your confidence this morning? Are you going on the right path? 
As an individual, the decisions that you have to make each and every day, there's so many, big and small. How do you have confidence it's the right decision? As husbands and wives, is your marriage going in the right decision? Where does your confidence come from? As fathers and mothers, as sons and daughters, as brothers and sisters, where does your confidence come from? As PCAC, as the body of believers, are we going the right direction? For the decisions that you are yet to make or now making, ask yourself this. Will my response and the decision that I make bring honor and glory to God, no matter my own circumstance? Or will I prioritize my own well-being and be ashamed before God? And secondly, make decisions with a proper perspective, not just looking to find confidence up until the point of death, but make decisions here and now that will give you confidence that you'll know that after you die, what awaits you after. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for the hearing and preaching of your word this morning. I thank you that you allow us to know your will, to receive your instruction through the scriptures that you preserve throughout time. I thank you, Jesus, for your obedience to the Father. to come to this earth to be born, to live a life without sin, to die, to be crucified, innocent as a spotless sacrifice to take our place upon the cross. And I thank you that you did not stay dead, but on the third day you rose again and you're coming back one day. I thank you, Holy Spirit, for opening our eyes, our ears, our hearts to hear, to understand. And I ask that you move us to surrender to you this morning. That we will surrender whatever is holding us back from following after you, Jesus. I pray for my brothers and sisters here this morning for the decisions that they're making each and every day. There's a lot of decisions that they're making and maybe some of the decisions they seem small, there's no right or wrong and maybe some decisions seem so big and huge and consequential that they are so paralyzed they don't know which to take. But either way, Lord, I pray that they would have confidence in the decisions that they make, knowing that they choose a decision that would honor and glorify you. That they would have freedom and joy in the small decisions that they make, knowing that there's joy and that there's freedom in Christ. And for the big decisions in life, there's so much financial weight behind it. There's so much relationship weight behind it. There's so many years of consequence behind it. But I also pray that you give them the freedom and joy to make the big and consequential decisions because they make a decision that they know will glorify and honor you. 
that no matter the outcome, what happens to them physically and momentarily here on this earth, that they can still rejoice and persevere because they know that you are being praised. I pray for our fathers and mothers that they would be an example to their children. That the many children who are right now at this moment at Children's Church who will be in Sunday school, who we pray right now are laughing and playing, that they would grow up in a home where this would be modeled. That they would find their confidence not in their earthly status, not in their earthly riches, but they would find their confidence in the ways that they bring honor to Jesus Christ. And they would know to do this because they grew up seeing mom and dad do this. That our youth would know to do this because they see the adults here doing this. And likewise, our adults here this morning would know what it means to follow Jesus Christ because they see the youth and how they're following Christ. Let's take a moment to consider the things that we need to surrender. If there's decisions that you are to make this following week, that you would have clarity about which decision would glorify God. And for many of us, perhaps we know which decision would glorify God. Perhaps it's a decision that would free up our finances to give more. Perhaps it's a decision that would free up our time and energy to be able to make disciples. But it's a hard decision because we first need to surrender many of our hopes and dreams that we have in this world. And so I pray that the Holy Spirit would convict you and give you the power to surrender that. Heavenly Father, thank you so much. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.